All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Pinterest, and thanks for being here. This is our first uh, ever Pin Talk in a series of Pin Talks that Pinterest is going to host every month, um, third or the fourth Thursday of every month. So if you'd like to be updated um, of our future Tech Talks, subscribe to Tech Talks at Pinterest.com, and we will keep you updated about all future Tech Talks. Um, so thanks for being here. Quick introduction. My name is Kinari Jangla. I am an engineer at Pinterest. I work in the home feed infrastructure team, and I'm at Kinnery at Pinterest.com. And um, I have been in Pinterest for five months, and I've been in the industry for around eight to ten years. So that's me. Uh, so I usually like to get a sense of what people think Pinterest is. So how do you guys define Pinterest? Last time I asked this question, someone said retail therapy for the broke. What do you guys think? Any one-liners? Any any people who don't use Pinterest here? Oh, I don't know, man. You're in the Pinterest office, not using Pinterest. <laughs> Great. What do you think it is? Beautiful. Somebody from Pinterest probably told you that. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, so that's what we like to think of Pinterest as. It's a catalog of ideas to enhance creative minds of people. Um, so... Let's do a quick Q&A. Um, damn. All right. uh, how many monthly active pinners worldwide do you guys think Pinterest has? Any ideas? No, not, not people who work at Pinterest. <laughs> You're not supposed to say it. Anybody else? Yeah, close. Yeah, we have 175 million active pinners worldwide uh, as of early this year. So... Yeah, monthly. That's right. Uh, all right. How many number of pins uh, do you think Pinterest has? Total number of pins that Pinterest hosts. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's right. How many number of boards do we have? Two billion. We have two billion boards in Pinterest. And then last one I have is how many businesses do you guys think Pinterest has? Any ideas? One million, one million plus. So clearly we have a lot of data. We have a lot of data that we need to ingest reliably, store, and fetch quickly and reliably as well. So that's a, you know, that's a big problem that Pinterest is solving. And so in that, Yu Yang, our engineer in the data engineering team today, is going to talk about scalable and reliable data ingestion at Pinterest. And I'm going to let him introduce himself more. Okay, so welcome everyone. Welcome to Pinterest. First, uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Yu Yang. I'm a software engineer on the data team, mostly works on the data infrastructure related projects today. And I joined Pinterest in 2014, about three years ago. And before that, I was at Microsoft for five years, working in Windows team and Windows Azure team <laughs> there. And yeah. Even before that, I was in Utah, right, enjoying the mountains there. Okay, cool. So now let's get started. Today we are going to talk about the, the, the data ingestion systems at Pinterest and how we solve the problem of scalability and reliability here. Okay, so, and first I would like to mention that this is the teamwork. I'm just uh, standing here presenting the work on behalf of the team. This, has, this work has been, uh, this is a, project that has been contributed by many engineers at Pinterest. So what is Pinterest? As we all know, Pinterest is a visual discovery engine. And there are endless ideas on Pinterest. So we have over 100 billion ideas that are collected by over 175 million people over the world on Pinterest. So on Pinterest, and you can find many ideas. You can find ideas on what you are going to eat, and what, you, what you are going to cook for dinner tonight. And you can find ideas on how to, that, how to decorate in your home. And you can also find ideas on what you are going to wear tomorrow. So, but under the hood, Pinterest is a data-driven product development. So we need to use data 
to gain insights and polish our data, polish our products to improve the painter experience. So we have many data-driven products from, for, from personalized recommendation to related paints to search quality to A-B experiments that to allow us to get insights on which UI is better and which feature is better and to spam control for, for us to detect the spammy pings at the earliest stage and protect pingers from being, getting spammed. So, and so, for, as, um, as a, in the data-driven data product de development, the first step is, is to get data. That is, we need to collect the data and ingest data into our system and make it ready for the downstream to use, right? At a very high level, this is a pretty straightforward problem to solve, right? Just collect the data and write. Everyone can write print, print out, print, print line or log, right? And then make the log available on the local disk. So what's the challenge? I think the challenge lies in when you try to scale the, when you try to collect the data in hundreds of terabytes over tens of thousands of hosts and how to collect the data in a scalable and a reliable way becomes a challenging and interesting problem to solve. And by the way, so if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and, uh, and ask questions and during the talk. Yeah. Uh, in general, spam control means for the spammer ping, spammy pings, for instance, there are some pings that, uh, uh, for instance, f uh, force promotion, for promo promotion pings that uh, bait people to click through or bait people to, to reping and to save. For the, this is one example. The other example is saying spammy followers, right? And some followers, some people just uh, intentionally, they're following many people to allow people to get attention on their accounts, et cetera, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, cool. So first let's look at the, the data types that we are going to inject. In general, there are, at a very high level, there are two data types we want to ingest. The first is online service logs, basically for any service that may log the data, and we want to ingest those data into our system. The second is the uh, Database snapshots. This is not may, many people may aware of. Why we need database snapshots? That's because if you think about Pinterest and we store the pings, we store all the pings related information in the databases. But the database is only for online serving. And we cannot, when we do the batch processing, we cannot just query the database and get the data and to do, the, do the, all the heavy lifting computation. That will put a lot of stress on the database systems and also affect our pinner experiences. Because of this, we need to take the snapshots of the databases and make it available offline for offline processing. Yeah. So these are the two, line, two different kinds of the data types. That's the online logs and also the database snapshots. And here are some numbers. So currently, we are logging about over 150 billion messages per day and we are ingesting over 180 terabytes compressed data into our data warehouse, that is S3, every day. And we are collecting data from the tens of thousands of hosts in the cloud. And at this scale, yeah? Do you have one data warehouse, or is it distributed as one data? And we use uh, S3 as our data warehouse. That's a uh, cloud storage, yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So at this scale, so we are having, um, at this scale, we have many problems as in scaling and in scalability and reliability. In the, in the rest of the talk, we will, we will talk, I will talk about how to address the scal scalability and reliability problems, and and how we can build the reliable and scalable ingesting systems at Pinterest. First. Let's look at the data ingestion requirements, right? The data, ing uh, data ingestion requirements. At a very high level, as I mentioned, data ingestion is a straightforward problem. That is, you log the data and uh, move the data into the cloud storage for downstreaming to use. But when you, as a scale, when you collect data from tens of thousands of hosts, so there are, what are the requirements we have? First, of course, is availability. The system, the data pipeline need to be highly available, always up and running, the second is no data loss. 
we want to minimize the data loss in the system so that the downstreaming uh, dependent services can make sound decisions. The third part is horizontal scalable. That is, when there is a spike of traffic, we can just uh, adding more machines and to deal with the traffic. And there also the low latency is another requirement that allow us to gain insights into the to get, get, get the data in, in near real time so that we can get insights into the pinners and uh, help improve our products. The finally is one, one part is often is uh, uh, people pay less attention is about the operation overhead. That as the scalable system, then maintaining uh, autonomous and uh, autonomous and self-running system is very important because we have a small team, and we can uh, without autonomous without system autonomous, we cannot scale our system and make it uh, operational and up and running reliably and scalably. Yeah. So now let's take a look at. So let's first let's take a look at the history of our system and see how we can we evolve our system in the past years to make it more reliable and scalable. And this diagram shows the Pinterest ingestion systems around about three years ago in 2014. At the time, when when someone used Pinterest services, when used Pinterest, right, then the Pinterest app or web application or Pinterest client, a mobile client, will send requests to Pinterest web services. From there, the web services will log messages, log some data, and write this data directly to a centralized message queue called Kafka, which is the open source software. At that time, we used Kafka 0.7, which doesn't support replication. And from there, there are two paths. One path you can, and some real-time consumers like Storm topologists can use those data for do some real-time processing. On the second path, and we have a data uploader, a daemon that runs on every broker that uploads the data from Kafka to S3. So this is a, this is a, the whole path is a is a path for the online log ingestion. At the same time, we have another path for the offline uh, database snapshot. We have a Hadoop streaming job that runs daily and pulls data from the slaves of the slave instances of the MySQL databases and stores the data into S3. Given this architecture, there are a few problems. The first problem is about the, the reliability. If you view this diagram, right, if you see, you can see there are many places that failure can happen. The Kafka broker can fail. If the Kafka broker fails, then we will have a data loss because there is no replication. Also, and the Kafka broker may have an outage, right, or may have a spike of traffic so that and the rights to Kafka brokers get really limited. When that happens, there will be a back pressure. When there is a back pressure happens, what shall we do? We have to cache the data in, in the memory in the web services to write, gradually write to the Kafka, right? But when, if the back pressure lasts for a long time and, and the buffer gets full and there will be a buffer overflow, and we also have data loss. At, at the same time, if you look at the database ingestion system, and we have the Hadoop streaming that directly reads data from a MySQL slaves and ingests data into S3. But if there is a database failover, and the, the, and the master fails, and when the slave nodes has to be promoted as a master, then we have stopped ingesting from the slave nodes. And when that happens, and we have give up the work that has been done for that shard, and we have to redo the work again. All these things make Hadoop streaming job quite fragile, and may fail multiple times when we try to take a snapshot of a large database. Given all these challenges, right, and I think we scratch our heads saying, what shall we do, right? One part we think, oh, it, on, the, on, the, on the online web, web log ingestion, on the online service ingestion side, we see that we want to decouple the dependency between the Pinterest web services, Pinterest online services, and Kafka. So that either when, if, a, if a Kafka has an outage, and we can still have the data cached somewhere for a longer period of time so that when the Kafka service is restored, we can re-upload the data. Also, um, on, the, on the database side, it's the same thing. When we want to decouple the uh, processing between the, we, we want to decouple the data reading and data sanitization for the data 
database snapshot, so that uh, we don't rely on. So that when there is a failover of the of the uh, MySQL databases, and the job itself will not be affected, and we don't need to retry the job multiple times. Instead, we just need to wait till the the DB uh, logical DB dump is ready, and so we can kick off the MapReduce job to do the processing. With this, so this slide talks about the challenges I have covered. And with this, and we evolved into the settings as shown in the next slide. This is here. And this is, the, this is the current setting and the data ingesting setting that we are currently using at Pinterest. You can see that sir, we added a few blue blocks, shows the, the individual components that we have built at Pinterest. First, on the on the web log ingestion side, on the online log ingestion side, right? We have we decouple. We want to decouple the dependency between the uh, online services and Kafka service. To do that, and we have the we we have the web online services directly writes the messages to the local disk, which is a much larger buffer than in the memory. From there, we have a standalone agent called Singer, the name is Singer, and uh, pick up those, listen to the file system events. When there is messages locked by those online services, it will pick them up and write to Kafka. Uh, from there, after the events and getting to Kafka, we will have another service, move the, we call it Merced, move the data from Kafka to S3. And after the data is getting to S3, we'll also do some post-processing like the data sanitization, data policy enforcement, and schema checking, et cetera, to make sure the data is v uh, cleanized and sanitized for the downstreaming to use. So this is the uh, online, online logging part, ingestion part. The second path is on the database ingestion. On the database ingestion side, instead of the having a MapReduce job just directly reads data from the MySQL, log MySQL databases and uh, write to S3, First, we have the script to take the logical CSV dumps from the databases. That's, there is a script that runs daily or hourly that uh, takes the logical CSV dump and stores the logical CSV dump in S3. After the logical dump is done, then we run another sanitization job to do the uh, proper format conversion and sanitization to make the data ready for the downstream to use. So. And that's uh, this is a high-level overview of a current setting of the data ingestion at Pinterest. The next, we, I will dive in in details into each of the inter individual components to see how we do the how what are the challenge what are the scalable scalability problems we encountered and we how we how we solve them. Uh, first, I will talk about the uh, Singer, the logging agent that we developed at Pinterest. Okay, so. The logging agent, and every so, and every company uh, has a use to to ingest systems into the message queue like Kafka or some similar other uh, message queues. Every company has uh, some logging agent to do the work, and here we use a, a singer to do the work. And there are common requirements for logging agent. First, it needs to be reliable, right? The logging agent needs to be up and running reliably and uh, and with no data loss. Second, it needs to be performant. So the logging agent needs to have high throughput and also low latency. When some events is locked, it can be picked up and sent to Kafka within sub-seconds. And also, it needs to be uh, very optimized so that it uh, uses the minimum amount of CPU and memory to minimize its computation footprint. Finally, it needs to be flexible that a logging agent needs to support multiple, various kinds of the data formats and support and data sources from various different places, right? To pick and write them to Kafka. So with this, these are the requirements. And with this, and uh, I will have a brief uh, overview of Singers, right? In Singer, in Singer, how we do the, how we achieve the, how we meet these requirements. Singer, in Singer, and the, at the very high level, the logging mechanism is very simple. And we just, for each application or web services, and we write the logs 
and to local disc. From there, Singer monitors the file system events and writes to Kafka. And the challenge lies in to make this performant and high throughput, to, to make the Singer high performant and reliable, right? So we use the stage event-driven architecture, and you can search for uh, this and this online. We use this uh, staged event-driven architecture that so that for Singer is event-driven and only do actions when some events is detected. And we have we use multiple threads pools, and from the thread pools for listening to the events and doing the event processing, and to the I/O network I/O layer for writing events. Um, to, to Kafka and to achieve high throughput. Currently, we can achieve um, over, one th over 100 megabytes per second on each individual host. That is way more sufficient for our current need. And uh, this is a very high level overview of Singer. So, yeah. I have a yeah. Uh, so, do you have to end up running this on like uh, high performance disks? Uh, you're writing all disks in the process? Or can you like you utilize caching or something like that? And and we can utilize uh, caching and uh, to minimize I/O read and thing. That that's the part. I will talk more about this and uh, in the next slides about the challenges of the in running Singer in the cloud on thousands of tens of thousands of hosts. So let's continue, right? And the challenges part. So when we talk about the logging agent, it seems as simple as just one process is running on one host. So what's what's the difficult part of it? But when you're thinking about you're running this process in tens of thousands of hosts in the cloud, and in each individual host may have different configuration, and and also you may encounter failures in various reasons. For instance, you may encounter failures because of a disk disk failure, or encounter problems because of a routing problem between the the host and the the Kafka brokers. All those failures, you want to detect those failures at the earliest time, and take actions to minimize the data data loss or data issues. So because of this, one mechanism we build in Singer is the Singer heartbeat. That is, when Singer is up and running, it will periodically send the heartbeat message to the Kafka topic. From there, and we can utilize that heartbeat message to do a few things. One is about failure detection. And because and we, can have, we have another standalone, the Singer failure detection service that just reads the, these heartbeat messages and periodically compare these uh, heartbeat messages with a list of the hosts that's run, supposed to uh, run in the cloud so we can detect what are the failures happens. Another important part is about logging completeness, right? When we're running in the tens of thousands of hosts in the cloud, at any time there's always some host has problem. And given that, how can we detect, make sure that de there is a minimum there is minimum data loss, and if there is any issue, we can detect it at the earliest stage. So we need to build a lot of the monitoring and the alerting mechanism around the data completeness to make sure we detect issues at the earliest stage. Uh, on the right side of the, the these slides, you can show see two things. On the on the upper right, you can see that there is a there is a alerting message that we we have received period, uh, regularly about if we there is any issues on single stop running on some host will get alerts by from the failure detection service saying the singer hasn't sent heartbeat from those hosts. The second part is that we also compute stats based on compute two stats. One stat is on the number of messages that the the, the, log, the online services writes to disk. Basically that's how many messages that has been logged by services to disk. This is one count. The second is uh, how many messages Singer uploads from the read from disk and log to Kafka. And we have we aggregated these two stats and compare them with the, each other. So if there is a diverge between these two stats, we'll get to alert we will get alerted. So based on that, you can see that on the on the bottom right, there are two lines, one is a green line, one is a uh, red line. These two lines should be uh, as close as possible. If there is a diverge, we'll get an alert on some logging issue, and we need to look into that. Okay. So these and with this effort, and it guarantees logging completeness. And finally, we build the single dashboard. That's the UI and allow us to gain insights into what's happening with the single logging at the real time. And we can break down this 
um, by topics and uh, by the by services. For each topic, we know how many services are logged to that topic, and we, we can zoom into each services and to see what are the hosts are logging to those topics. Yeah. So this covers the the logging agent part and singular part, right? And the next, I will talk about the Kafka, the Kafka part, right? So, and as show, we have talked about the the singular part, and that's uh, writing data from the writing data from an Collect data from uh, ten thousand hosts and write to Kafka. So, which is a central message queue? So, and the question: How many people knows Kafka? Oh, great! So, I don't need to explain and spend too much time explain Kafka. But here is just one slide on Kafka 101, just in case some of you are not familiar with Kafka. At a very high level, Kafka is a replicated message queue system. is a, a scalable, high performance message queue system. That is a, is a, you can view it as a message queue, a replicated message queue, and, you can, and any service can rise to. It's horizontal scalable, and it's low latency. If you rise the message to the queue, it will be available in the queue within a milliseconds. And it also has high throughput. And two, the way that Kafka makes the message queue scalable is by dividing a queue into multiple partitions. When a queue is divided into multiple, and each individual service can write to on some specific partitions, and so that the, the whole queue the, can be scalable and uh, to, accom to accommodate more traffic. So, and this is the, running the Kafka service in the cloud is a challenge for us, actually. So, in, in detail, when we are running, running the Kafka in the cloud, and we are using the D2X large instances, and uh, while our services and while we have getting more and more users, our s traffic ramps up, running Kafka in the cloud becomes a challenge. Why is it a challenge? People may ask. Well, first is we often get unexpected node failures because of various reasons. For instance, the local disk may the, the local disk may fail. The local disk may fail, or suddenly we may told by Amazon saying, oh, your host is running on the degraded hardware. So we have to move the traffic to another host. And also, we also because Kafka is replicate, replicated to queue, it doesn't mean we can just deploy the the whole deploy the data into three re different replica on three different virtual machines. That would be sufficient because if you think about the the physical host, right? One um, physical host can we use it, we are using we use this D, we use D two X large, and one physical host can host up to eight virtual machines. If we happen to have all three replica uh, to deploy on the virtual machines that's, that sits on the same host, same physical host, when that physical host has some problem, then basically we, we will still have that loss because we, we will lost all replica. That's all the virtual machines sitting on the same physical host. That's a problem that we want to solve too. To solve that problem actually is uh, actually very simple. We just, we want to, um, we 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 guarantee that uh, um, replica are deployed to multiple physical hosts by deploying the to to guarantee to make sure that uh, the replicas on the same of the same topic partition must be exist must be deployed on at least two available zones basically if the host if the replica uh, is deployed on two or more available zones they must be on the different host, physical hosts so that even if one physical host died, we still have the data in some other physical host to make sure the data is available. But still, with this operating Kafka in the cloud, is still the painful so is a painful experience. We get a page, maybe we may get a page during the night, uh, when we are, we are having dinner, or when we are getting out to do something. And uh, this adds a lot of op operation overhead on the team. Also, if you run have experience of running Kafka, you may notice that the Kafka after running for a while and the Kafka the workload the workload on the Kafka brokers may become unbalanced. And also we need to manually to do some balancing work. All these as as significant operation overhead on the team. To address this we think uh, we should to do we should do the we try to automate the Kafka operation. So and to do the, uh, in order to do that to reduce our operation overhead, we build a service called Dr. Kafka that is for the cluster healing and the load balancing. And this diagram shows the, 
the details of the, the high-level design for Dr. Kafka, right? It primarily com composed of the two parts. One is a set of the metrics collector that is deployed onto every Kafka broker. That is, on every Kafka broker, we have a process. is a metrics collector process running and collects the pro uh, stats from Kafka processes and also some basic system stats from the host. And for instance, the metrics collector can tell if there is a disk failure on the host or not. And the metrics collector periodically sends these stats to a central a Kafka topic. Let's say, let's call it broker metric. And after that, we also have a central a Dr. Kafka service. The central Dr. Kafka service will read the data. First, it will read data from the broker metric. From there, based on, from there, and it can infer the resource requirement for each replica. And then it does two. And it, there are two modules in, in Dr. Kafka. One is about failure detection. That is, that Dr. Kafka had the threads running for each cluster and periodically check, oh, is this cluster healthy? Does it have any uh, broker failure? Does it have any under-replicated partitions? If, it's a, if there is any, it will analyze the reason and try to take some actions. And second part is the workload management. When, it, when the Dr. Kafka detects a failure, it will try to move the workload on the failed nodes to some other nodes. It will always move the move the workload, assigned workload, to the nodes that has the least workload, and least traffic, so that it can make sure that the workload among the rest of the brokers can be balanced. Mm. So when any any time when Dr. Kafka take actions, it will also write events to another talk Kafka topic called action log that can be viewed through UI so that people can know what's, what is going on, what are the actions that Dr. Kafka is taking. Yeah, question? So Dr. Kafka is feeding from Kafka Broker, whether it's the problem with that Yes. Uh, so the, 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 question, the question is, so currently, you see, Dr. Kafka has dependency on Kafka cluster itself, right? So there is a cyclic dependency. If the Kafka Broker if the Kafka cluster has a failure, what will happen? So there are two things. First, so the, the Dr. Kafka only for, can manage multiple clusters. And the broker metric is usually sits on just one, one cluster. And if the rest of the Kafka cluster has a problem, and it will not affect this metrics collecting. The second, if and the, the cluster that hosts a broker metrics has issue, first we will guarantee, first, and it's usually, but still, but if there is just one broker failure or two broker failure, and there is no data loss, and the Kafka, the Dr. Kafka can still read the data from the other replica, right? So there will still be no issue. But in the worst case, if all the data in the broker metric is lost, basically then the Kafka, Dr. Kafka just say, oh, I don't, I, I don't have enough information. I cannot take action. I will just send, send out alert to our team, say, oh, there was some issue. So, yeah. Although there is, seems of a cyclic dependency, actually this is, uh, they were not causing any issue in the real operation side. Okay, cool. And there's one more thing that I would like to talk about. One interesting problem that we encountered in the implementing Dr. Kafka is how to precise, precisely and um, capture the computers, the replica stats. I, I would like to share the, our experience here. When you think about the because Dr. Kafka needs to reassign the workload. And to do that, and to make sound decisions on reassign the workload, and Dr. Kafka needs to and compute the replica stats, the resource requirements for each replica in more pre precisely, so that it can make sound decisions. When you think about the problem, it initially it seems straightforward, right? You can just read the historic uh, broker stats then you can infer the minimum and the maximum resource usage for each system metrics, like the network or CPU or disk. Um, but the interest, but but the problem is that there is a partition reassignment. When there is when there is some, for instance, if there is an incident, we need to we need to move the work, workload around. When that happens, and it will incur extra 
network traffic and network CPU usage, etc. Right? For the Kafka brokers, like what it shows on the right of these slides, when that happens, it will distort the network metric and prevent us from getting the precise metric for making the workload assignment, workload management decisions. Then, then because of that, and during the stats collection, and we need to be we need to aware the the partition reassign, partition reassignment activities and exclude those tests during the partition reassignment, and also, but excluding the tests during the partition reassignment is not also not sufficient because after the partition reassignment finish, although the traffic drops immediately, but the tests because main is is still we still need a cooldown period. To get the the mean stats, especially for instance, the 15 minutes average, uh, the average network inbound and outbound traffic in the past 15 minutes, what's the net number? We still also wait need to wait for those numbers to be, uh, to get cool off, to to get to the normal traffic, not including those distorted traffic due to the reassignment. So because of that, we also add the, we also need to exclude the stats during the cooldown period so that we can compute those replica stats. Uh, more precisely, and to make sound decisions. So, and this slide shows some of the UI of the Kafka stat, of the Kafka uh, Doctor Kafka. And you can see from the upper left, and the Kafka class Doctor Kafka can manage multiple clusters. And on the bottom left, and shows the details of one test cluster. And you can see because the Kafka broker, the workload Kafka workload is mostly network bounded. And we're focusing on most on the net network related to traffic. It shows the maximum and inbound and the network bound, maximum the uh, inbound and and outbound network traffic for each broker. On the right side, it shows the, the base some the part of the stats we collect from the one broker. For instance, we collect some basic stats like the network traffic. We also collect stats of the for each. We also uh, collect stats saying, for instance, how many replica on this host, and among those replica. How many replica are leader replica, and and we have the detailed information on each leader replica, including the is traffic is this a leader is it in in, in reassignment right now, is it under replicated and all and along with the, all the network traffic's metrics, and finally, and I'm happy to announce that we are going to to open source Dr. Kafka today. And this has been, you can visit this URL on GitHub, Pinterest GitHub, and see Dr. Kafka and give it a try. And we are welcome any feedbacks on this. Yeah. Cool. So this is, uh, with Dr. Kafka, actually, it has helped us to, to recover multiple, quite a few instances and reduce operation overhead on our team. And lastly, and lastly, we'll talk about at the last stage, I will talk about how to move the data uh, from the Kafka to S3 in a scalable and reliable way. So if you know Kafka, as you know, Kafka is a message queue system that can only store the data in a short period of time. And because of that, and we need to move the data from Kafka to S3 for the permanent storage, right? And how to move data from the uh, Kafka to S3 and reliably and in a scalable, reliable, and efficient way is also a challenge problem, an interesting problem to solve. At the very high level, we need, for instance, we need strong consistency. For each message, we only want to process to S storage only once. And we also need want the ser service to be fault tolerant. If there is any failure, worker failure, and it will not, it, the other workers will just pick up the workload so that we can guarantee the data still be ingested into our system on time. And also, we want the system to be horizontal scalable, and when the, so that when the workload traffic, when there is a workload spikes and the traffic ramps up, we can just add more machines to deal with those extra workloads. So then, to deal with problem, deal with this problem, we build uh, another service called Merced. And here it shows the, and this slide shows the high level design of Merced. Right, Merced using uh, a master worker approach that it has, it uses a central master for work workload distribution, and it also has a set of workers to the actual, 
to do the actual work of reading data from Kafka and move the data to S3. So the master will just, uh, given a set of topic, the master will re read the uh, data from the Kafka and knows all the metadata information and create the tasks and assign those tasks to the workers. And the workers will the, pick up those tasks and just do the actual work of the reading from that data from Kafka and, move, and processing data to S3. One interesting, one part is uh, one requirement of the data persisting is what we want to guarantee is exact, exact once persisting. We achieve this through the through the um, consistent file naming across multiple instances. For instance, assume if there is a assume there is an incident, one worker died, right? And so the master assigns workers to some another work assigns work to another worker. And then, after a while, after a while, then the previously problematic worker comes back and re resume to do the same work again. Then, if there are two workers doing the same task, how can we still guarantee the exact one's delivery? So the, the way we solve the problem through the uh, through the uh, file naming that is for each worker is when it processing the data, it's only be assigned for one single partition or multiple partitions and with a, and with some specific off starting offset so we name the we name the files in the concat in, in the concatenation of pi, um, partition id plus offset and this is a unique naming so when the worker starts to do the work when they pick up the task it knows the partition the, the kafka topic partition that it needs to process it and it also knows the offsets is to, it needs to read data from, so it will form a unique name, and so the two workers will generate the same name, and so even if there are two workers doing the same work, it will just re-upload the data twice instead of, and it will not, it will not, and uh, store two copies of the data in S3. And with this, and uh, finally. And uh, we also build some the build visibility into the Merced and to allow us to gain insights into the how the worker is doing in the in the Merced. For instance, here is the Merced dashboards and allow us to have an overview on the Merced workers and the progress and and its stats. So and lastly, after we talked about this, right, and we have presented what's the What's the data ingesting system at the Pinterest? And what are we doing? We have built the system, system in the past years. What are we doing now? One part we would like to still continue to improve is on the database ingesting side. That is, so currently we are log, as I mentioned in the previous slides, we are, we are dumping data into, from S3 using the scripts to dumping the logic CSV data into S3. Then we have the sanitizer job running and makes the data available. But with that, first we can only uh, dump in the data every a few hours or every day, every day, or taking the snapshot. Sometimes we need more frequent snapshot. And how to get more frequent snapshot from the databases? That's also an interesting problem that we want we're attacking. So we are what what we the solution is we are building a bridge between the MySQL databases and Kafka. From there, we have the daemon running on the Kafka, on the MySQL hosts that read the bing logs and uh, passing the messages to Kafka. From there, we will do the compaction and uh, store everything and go through the Kafka Merced workflow and generate the, snapshot, generate the incremental snapshot and the complete snapshot and for downstreaming processing. And that's, uh, and also, one part that we ha I haven't mentioned is about the schema, right? And when the data flows through the system, and we currently we are just what we I talked about is a building the reliable and a scalable pipe to allow the data to flow through. But what's what's inside the mess? What is what's what are flowing inside the pipe is also very important. How to guarantee the, the data schema correctness and the schema involvement and and correct data schema evolution, that's also an interesting problem that we are solving. So with this, I'm um, just concluding the talk. And this is the awesome Pinterest team, and we are hiring. <laughs>
Right. Any questions, guys? We're going to open up to Q&A. Any questions for you? No? Yeah. So have you um, already started uh, trialing Maxwell, or is it already in use at all? And we already actually, we, and Henry from our team, we already tried Maxwell and make changes to Maxwell and to make it uh, um, available for our production usage. Yeah, and also the the change is public available on the Maxwell GitHub. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the some of the is this uh, Zendesk Maxwell or? Yeah, the Zendesk Mac, Wax, Maxwell. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the changes you had to make? I think. Uh, one changes is about uh, saying we want to support more flexible the table creation and also schema changes. I think you can check the GitHub uh, repo for details. And yeah, thanks. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Um, so I noticed a change. Um, you know, like basically um, what you are at today. Um, looks like you're basically doing the sanitization before you put data, I mean, before you put data into S3, right? But the direction you want to move to is you would want first put the uh, data into S3 and then you would do the sanitization. Um, why the switch, I guess? Oh, I think that I didn't draw the diagram very well oh. because we're using S3 as a cloud storage, as a data warehouse. When we ingest data, we move the data into S3. From there, we also do the processing and uh, move that into another location that's for the downstreaming pro to use. Okay. So there is basically there are two locations, one in the raw data set, one in the sanitized data set. Got yeah. it. Thanks. We can ask questions. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? We have five more minutes, so we can take a couple more questions. But if not, my name is Kinnery Jangwa, and I'm at Kinnery at Pinterest.com, and we're always hiring. Uh, if you'd like to send me a resume, do so. Otherwise, careers at Pinterest.com. And uh, for future Tech Talks, everyone, subscribe to Tech Talks at Pinterest.com. But otherwise, thanks you for today, and thanks all for coming. Hope you've had a chance to get some dinner, and good night.